Welcome everybody. This is uh, Dr. Perry and uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we refer to as the intimacy barrier. Some of you who uh, are familiar with the study of proxemics will recognize some of these concepts. A lot of you who work with at-risk youth uh, will recognize some of these issues as well. Um, basically what I want to talk about today is the way in which our history of relational experiences earlier in life influence the way we function in the present. Now that of course is a huge topic, uh, but I'm gonna hone in on one specific aspect of that. And that has to do with the way our personal internal catalog of experiences shapes the way we view human beings and then how we bring that into our current interactions with another person. And so uh, again, those of you who've been tracking with a lot of our work, you're familiar with our uh, little diagram here where we show this space alien mother uh, with her green neuro sort of sociology, part of her brain that appears to be all green and in what we're indicating here is that that's normally developed. This is a mother who is capable of feeling uh, pleasure and uh, reward when she interacts with others, particularly her own little baby. And in the mirroring interaction that takes place, there's a reciprocal activation of the same parts of the brain in the mom as there are in the infant. And, and this attentive, attuned caregiving uh, that is provided by this mother or caregiver or father or grandma, whoever it is that's being this attentive, attuned caregiver in the moment is helping build into the brain of the infant healthy neurobiological capabilities, neural, neural networks that will help this child form and maintain healthy relationships. And so, again, in the previous sessions, we talked a little bit about how in this attentive, attuned, responsive interaction from a caregiver early in life, we start to make associations, connections between the neural networks in, responsible for relationships and the neural networks responsible for reward and pleasure, and then the neural networks responsible for stress regulation uh, and the stress response. And so under normal healthy conditions, these three systems get wo woven together and somebody grows up with the capability to be attentive, attuned, loving, caring to other people. Now, the truth is everybody has an array of primary relational experiences. So early in life, when you're first born, you start to build a catalog of experience. And it's based upon the nature of these interactions you have. And you may have some interactions where somebody is hostile and threatening. and It's not regulating, it's actually dysregulating. And then you may have these moments where somebody looks you in the eyes and rocks you and speaks to you with a tender voice and you feel like you're the center of the universe and you feel literally through this somatosensory bath provided by this person, you feel love. And you may have uh, other interactions from the same person where you're not the center of the universe and they're talking on the phone or they're making dinner or something else and you're kind of looking and want, wishing that they would come back and pay attention to you. And then there's times when your caregiver may be down or depressed. And so everybody has this whole set of developmental experiences that helps create your own personal uh, worldview about human beings. And, and again, this is a slide that we use to kind of show how this attentive, attuned, responsive caregiver meets the needs of the physiologically distressed, hungry, thirsty, cold infant that activates uh, certain neural networks in the brain involved in a reward. Uh, and so the, the systems in the brain that are processing the somatosensory cues that have to do with a, a, that human being are being processed at the same time that the neural networks involved in pleasure are being activated and the neural networks involved in regulation are activated. So this, this you know, three-part set of associations is kind of what happens uh, in an in interaction where the caregiver is present, 
attentive, attuned, and responsive. And so if you're a little child and you're lucky enough to be born into an environment uh, where you've got attentive, attuned caregivers, the first time you have a interaction with somebody and, and you it's present, attentive, attuned, and responsive, they meet your needs, you feel pretty positive about people. And then you make another association about people, they're good. And then, you know, your worldview is beginning to be shaped about the way people are. And, and you may have one interaction where, wow, it wasn't so great. They weren't attentive. They weren't responsive. They let me sit and cry for a long time before they came. And then there may be one where they're right on top of it. You know, the moment you feel any distress, they're right there. They're attuned. They feed you. Uh, and, and this will go on and on and on. And if you're lucky enough to have a caregiver who's, pretty well regulated herself, has lots of supports. Uh, there are lots of people that are involved in the, in the caregiving experience. You get lots of these positive experiences and the experiences you get that are unpredictable or somebody's absent or even angry are fewer relative to the interactions where somebody's present, attentive, attuned, and responsive. And pretty soon your internal representation of people shifts from neutral over to people are positive, people are caring, people are, are good, people uh, are you know, sources of pleasure and, and regulation, and your internal view about people shifts. And what that means is, the next time you meet another human being, your expectation in this interaction is that they're going to be positive, so you project nonverbal cues of positive engagement, which of course, because of the reciprocal nature, the, the contagious nature of the neurobiology of connectedness, you elicit from somebody positive cues. And your brain, you're literally, your internal representation about what people are begins to be, in many ways, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you expect good things, your brain looks for good things, and it minimizes negative things. And pretty soon you have this self-reinforcing worldview. Um, and that can be a very positive thing. Now, it, your view of people, like I said, safe, regulating, rewarding. And in general, you don't think that people are this way. You don't think that they're dysregulating or unpredictable because your personal history of experiences has been on the whole pretty positive. But that's not the experience of lots of people. You know, some people have a caregiver who's overwhelmed, or they have somebody in their early developmental experience, hostile, threatening. Uh, and, and rather than having the reward systems activated, when somebody interacts with you in this unpredictable way and isn't meeting your needs, but is basically angry that you are expressing your needs, you know, if you're hungry, thirsty, and cold, and you cry, they come and they're angrier, they're in, unpredictable, they, they, they give you all kinds of nonverbal and maybe verbal cues. Uh, raise your, you know, they raise their voice. They, they're rough with you when they change your diaper. And it activates, that activates your stress response system, your locus ceruleus noradrenergic network, which is the backbone basically of the stress response, gets activated and you start to make an association between all of the somatosensory cues of, of relational interaction and threat. So, your experience is very different than somebody who had this other really positive experience. You end up sort of neutral at birth, and then you start to have some of these not so great experiences, and, and you have a lot of them. And you may have some good experiences, but by and large, your experiences with people are weighted towards unpredictable, uh, episodically hurtful, uh, angry a lot, and your worldview of people begins to reflect that. And the older you get, and the more of these that accumulate, the more you shift your internal representation of people to being untrustworthy. Intimacy, closeness to people doesn't make you feel regulated. It's not rewarding, it's scary. It makes you feel frightened. And so, this is when we refer to this intimacy barrier part of what we're talking about is related to this personal history of experience 
that has created your own internal catalog of what people are. Now, of course, I kind of showed you two examples, but the truth is people, were, there's a whole spectrum all the way from, you know, somebody's always telling you that you're the best thing since sliced bread to somebody who's overtly abusive and hostile and, and humiliating and degrading all the time. And so depending upon how this balances out, you're gonna have some mixture of positive and negative associations about human beings. And, and part of what that means is that you're going to have a, a, a different perspective about intimacy than many, many other people. Intimacy for some people is associated with comfort and love and so forth. And the intimacy barrier is something that we talk a lot about in our clinical work. So you can have somebody, let's say, who's had a generally positive set of human experiences, and they can have casual interactions with human beings and they don't feel threatened. And they can have routine interactions where the rules are clear, like in school, the rules are clear when you're in class, they're clear when you go to work. And then they can have personal interactions with somebody where somebody asks about something that's personal and it still doesn't feel threatening. And they can even have intimate interactions with people. But even no matter how well regulated you are, no matter how healthy your internal catalog is, there are some things that are very, very intimate. And unless you invite somebody in, it will feel threatening if somebody crosses that barrier. Let me give an example. If, you know, if I have somebody that I care for and they give me a, a very long lingering hug, that feels very, that, that's kind of nice. But if somebody that I don't know wants to give me a long lingering hug, that's very uncomfortable. And when that happens, it activates your stress response. And, and if you're a well-regulated person like I am, you start to use your words to, to reestablish the intimacy barrier. You might say something like, gee, I'm not much of a hugger and, and sort of gently try to disengage from that person. Now, if you are, on the other hand, like a lot of the kids that we work with who have had a mixture of human experiences early in life, they may do fine in a casual interaction and they may do fine in the classroom, but as soon as they get out on the playground and there's unstructured opportunities for other kids to be personal and say stuff like, where are you from? Or why do you dress that way? Or, you know, where's your mom? All, all kinds of things that might seem kind of innocent to them. It's very intensely personal to a child in uh, foster care, for example. And that will cross that person's intimacy barrier and they will uh, actually have an activation of their threat response. Now remember, most of these kids that we work with, when we activate their stress response, they don't have this linear relationship. So when somebody sort of crosses my personal space and asks me something that's inappropriate, I'll have an internal activation that's kind of appropriate but I'll still be able to use my words. But the kids that we're working with, if you remember, most of them have this sensitized stress response. So for a relatively minor personal faux pas that crosses this child's intimacy barrier, they may have a very profound reaction and they may actually hit the kid who asks them something about where's your mom or where are you from? or why do you dress that way? And this combination of a sensitized stress response and a different sense of personal space and proxemics makes lots of problems. So this is, this is a diagram from a classic uh, book about intimate space and personal space. And basically this is showing, Edward Hall did this, and um, basically what he's showing here is that if somebody's, you know, further than 12 feet away, between 12 and 25, this, that's kind of considered public space. So like if you're in a 
waiting for a bus and somebody's 12 feet away, you don't feel threatened. If somebody gets closer, if they get between 12 and four feet, that starts to get into what would be a social space. Like they may, uh, you may be okay with them sitting down on the, on the bench next to you. But if they get within four feet, they start to get into your personal space. And once that happens, it activates your stress response. Even with people that you know, if they get close enough, basically, to easily touch you physically, that activates the normal, well-regulated person's stress response. And then, of course, if they cross your intimate space, then people feel quite uncomfortable and some people feel quite threatened and they may actually do things to reestablish that space. Now, now think about these distances, and this is a typical person. There are all kinds of things that influence these spaces, including culture. So if you are uh, from different cultures, uh, you're going to have had a history of what's considered an acceptable distance for uh, social space, for personal space, and then for intimate space. And you can see this is very culture bound. Now, not only is it culture bound by country, but it's, it's bound by personal experience. So if you take somebody who has a history of maltreatment, you, their intimate space, their sense of that you are in their face is very much bigger than somebody who hasn't had that experience. So if you're standing three feet away or standing behind one of these individuals, that feels very threatening. And eight feet is considered personal space. And so if you're working with kids in the juvenile justice system, many of whom have a history of maltreatment, and you have confined spaces, you're basically inadvertently escalating everybody in that environment. And so somebody may ask a child just to, to do a tiny little thing, but because they're already uh, activated and they're partway up this arousal continuum, and you ask you know, them to do something like comply and get in line or do whatever they're supposed to do, you can frequently tip them off and uh, precipitate significant behaviors with a relatively minor request. And this is something that we see all the time. You know, the way that we see this manifest a lot with kids that are, uh, have developed what we call relational sensitivity is that when a, an adult comes over and gets, tries to physically comfort them without their permission, the child will push back. The child may use foul language, the child may hit them. This is where you hear these kids that will sometimes threaten to kill their foster parent, or they'll say, you're the worst person, I hate you. And then they will, you know, an hour later, come and crawl in the lap of the foster parent. But the difference is if the child controls the process, it's completely different to them than if you control the process of closing the physical distance. So when you go over without their permission to physically comfort them, you're violating their intimate space and they're going to have this reaction. On the other hand, if they choose to come over and seek touch, and comfort, then they don't feel as threatened by it. And this is a very, con this is a universal aspect of crossing the intimate, intimacy barrier. This is true for all of us. If somebody came up to me and, and wanted to give me a kiss without my permission, that would be violating my intimacy barrier. And I would not want, I would not like that. It would make me feel uncomfortable and pretty stressed out. On the other hand, if, if I invite somebody across my intimacy barrier because I want them to kiss me, that's a completely different thing. And so controllability of the process is important. And many of you who've worked with a lot of these kids who have relational sensitivity have heard that they wanna have Billy over to play and, and it goes perfectly as long as Billy does exactly what the child says. We're gonna play exactly the way I play, we're gonna change the rules the way I wanna change it, and as soon as Billy wants to do something different, then Billy gets attacked by the child, you know, verbally or, or sometimes physically. And so this, this relational sensitivity is a huge thing. And think of it, the easiest way to think of it is, those of you who know much about trauma, 
you've heard about evocative cues. Just think about relational interactions as evocative. So physical proximity and relational intimacy are evocative cues. And so they'll have a classic trauma-related set of behaviors in response to the evocative cues. And sometimes it will be an activating behavior, and sometimes it will be a shutdown behavior. But both of them will be maladaptive in the situation. And here's a few things that uh, you can keep in mind when you're uh, working with kids that have intimacy barrier challenges. Um, we've written a little bit about this. We have a 10-tip document about uh, living and working with uh, kids that may have an issue with the intimacy barrier. and We can make that available for folks. But one of the things I, I, I think about a lot is how lucky I am, for example, to be privileged enough to have space to get away from the other people who I am sheltering in place with once in a while. But imagine if you're a foster child or a child who has a history of relational uh, inconsistency and unpredictability, and you have to be in the same physical space as multiple other people. And this would be extremely difficult for you. And I think that this is one of the things that we're going to hear about a lot. We're going to see a lot of the negative consequences of individuals who have been uh, in the same space for too long and have had too little control over their own uh, level of pro proximity to others, and they've had too little control over physical intimacy and potentially emotional intimacy. And I think it's going to lead to a lot more meltdowns and, and significant challenges. Um, now, again, this issue is very important in schools. And I think that uh, a lot of educators, when they learn a little bit about the, the intimacy barrier, begin to think differently about uh, unsolicited touch. They think differently about unsolicited uh, physical proximity. That, so if you're a teacher and, and you've got a neurotypically organized kid and you walk over and you just stand next to their desk and you talk with them, that you, know, you can be four feet away and you're still in that child's social space. And, and, and therefore you have an escalated the child and they will be able to hear what you have to say because their cortex is still open for business. But if you get four feet away uh, from a dysregulated kid, you're right on the boundary of their intimate space and you're well within their personal space, which means that you've activated their stress response. And if they have any degree of sensitized stress response, uh, which is highly likely, they'll literally shut down cognitively and they will not hear you. They will not process the words accurately. They will not process the interaction with you accurately. And if something happens where there's a misunderstanding, a blow up, a confrontation, their understanding of what happened will be completely different than your understanding. And the teacher and the student will both be absolutely convinced 100% that they're right and accurate. And when they recount the experience to the principal, uh, they'll have two different stories. And it doesn't always have to be a teacher and a student. It can be a, one student and another student. And uh, this happens all the time with people that have uh, differences in where they are on this, um, this continuum. And again, one of the big challenges that we have in our field is that a lot of times the people who are uh, doing work with kids like this are people who are organized like this. And they use what we call theory of mind. And theory of mind means if you're over here and you think people are safe, regulating, rewarding, and you see a poor kid who's upset and, and, and had a bad day at school, we want to go over and give them a hug. But the reality is they don't view hugging as safe and predictable. They view you coming into their space without permission to give them a hug as dysregulating, unpredictable, and escalating. And so there's this frequently a misunderstanding between the people who we call the big green humpers and the kids that we're trying to help who aren't organized the same way. And uh, maybe we can talk about that on a different session.